good, but hi everybody, I'm Wendy Murdoch. This is Webinars with Wendy. I'm broadcasting to you today in front of a library. It's a little uh, plein air show today. Um, I was hoping to find a little quieter location, but this was the best I could do because I'm heading out for two weeks. Um, anyway, today my guest is Becky Tenges, and I'm so glad to have her back. And I'm gonna just turn it over to her so that you don't have to like try to hear me. Oh, we've got somebody from France. That's awesome. All right, Becky, take it away. <laughs> hey, everybody, how are you? I'm so honored to be here again, Wendy. Uh, it's, um, it's really good because it makes me get things out of my head and onto, onto paper to help me talk to you all. So um, I think I will go ahead and share my screen. Welcome, everybody. Yeah, and just give me um, a little bit of your background, Becky, in case they've never seen uh, uh, one of these webinars before. Um, yeah, we'll we'll do. Um, let me change this to. Uh, no slideshow. Play not from that one. Uh, play from the start. Um, so my background is I. <laughs> I um, grew up on a horse farm and um, my father was a farrier. And so I had a lot of exposure to horses and I loved them. And we, um, you know, I had various horses of my own over time and my parents with the horse, um, they had an Arabian breeding farm. At the peak, they had 110 horses. So lots and lots of horses, um, lots of riding, lots of uh, just, you know, everything horse. Um, so I really um, didn't, so this is me. Can you see my pointer? Uh, maybe you not Wendy, but somebody else. Um, the picture of me on the left is uh, perhaps the uh, horse that I have worked with in my 11 years of doing this kind of stuff that had the most profound um, impact on me in terms of interacting and partnership. And then the horse, and I'll talk about that later, but um, anyway, he's just a horse that's special to me. The horse on the right is um, a horse that sort of started this journey for me of learning to be uh, a body worker. Um, his name was Prince Ivan and, um, and started me off on, on the first step of this super long uh, escapade of learning all things uh, body work and horse and anatomy. Um, I've been at this uh, for, I don't remember how long, I have to figure it out, 10 years or 11 years. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where one thing leads to another. And I just have had uh, so been so blessed to learn from uh, the best. And I, you know, get emotional. I just have to, to give a huge shout out to everybody on this list. Um, Quite the list. It's a, it is a really long list. And, um, you know, all the folks over on the left, left are, um, people from the horse world. And as I bumped into um, content or knowledge or, or information that I um, was hoping to have, but it wasn't there yet in the horse world, I jumped over to the human world. And so there's some of the names that, um, that I have. Uh, hey, Becky, um, I got one question for you about the- that I've gotten are all those things on the left. Yeah. The, the Arabians, I just had a guest on, on Friday, Amy Lissato is from Colorado, but she was from Wyoming and they raised Arabians. So yeah. I'm wondering if your dad knew her dad. It's possible. Uh, my, my folks were California, we were California people. Okay. And, um, and so, I, you know, but dad was one of those, um, I don't know, he was like Velcro. He just got stuck with lots of, uh, and attached to lots of folks and, and, um, he was, uh, he was a really um, gregarious fellow that knew lots of people. So I don't know. But because possibly... the Arabian world back then wasn't very big, and it's like everybody knew everybody. Yeah. So it, I just find it yeah. fascinating that so many people are connected through the Arabian horse breed from that era. I think that's fascinating. It's like fascia. Yeah, it's I know. Like that's what I'm Everything's connected to everything. And then somebody said that you forgot to add all the horses that uh, we touch as you are on our list, right, Becky? It's, you forgot to add all of the horses we touch as you are on our list. So, you know, 
I, I mean, this is an incredible list that you have here. And I think it's so amazing that you're a life. On learner. this list, I should have a bunch of horses. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all the horses. Oh. Yeah, I'm an addict, it turns out. Yeah. <laughs> my, my name is Becky, and, and, I'm, and I'm a knowledge addict. <laughs> You know, it's people like you that really take this information and gel all the information from these people, and then bring it forward in a in a in a cohesive way that jumps off from that. And I think that this is one of the things that we forget when we're when we and it's why I always ask people their background because when we start to look, no one's in isolation. Nobody created everything themselves. There's always been people yeah. that you know, standing on the shoulders of giants is a great term that I've recently heard. And these are giants, and you're standing on the shoulders of giants, but you're also moving forward from their knowledge in combining with your knowledge and your expertise in education and moving it forward. And I think that that's something to be so applauded and acknowledged is how we keep learning and progressing and, and refining and shaping so that it becomes easier and easier and more accessible. And I think that's one of the things that's so important is that we make this knowledge more accessible to the average person. So I, now that I've got my sound a little better, I, I got my headset on. I just want to thank you so much for being one of my guests today and bringing all of this consolidated information together, along with all those horses you've touched, to move it forward. Um, and yeah. hopefully you're not hearing all of the background sound that I'm experiencing right now. Well, you know what? You can just, you know, you can just take it, you know, a relax because you look great and we can hear you super good and okay. everything's good. We can't see what's happening off screen. So oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Okay, it's all good. so I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just wanted to make no, sure. No, 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 it's, it's totally fine. I, um, you know, when I, when I teach, um, I tell people that, you know, strap yourself in because it's going to be kind of like standing in front of an open, fi open fire hydrant. Um, <laughs> and and um, I found myself on this topic today. I've been thinking about it. You and I have talked a long time. And as I work with horses and, and um, I stand around, you know, waiting for attention to, and restriction to release, you know, my mind is playing over, you know, what would I say and how would it work? And um, I'm not very good at weeding things out. So there's a lot of information here. And even so, it's a teeny tiny tip of the iceberg of um, the information that um, we could talk about with uh with fascia and restriction um but i'm gonna give it a shot um and so as i was thinking about this topic what my, my topic today is um fascia and fascial uh, i call them fascial freeways i'll talk later about why um and then uh, finding tension and restriction and how to begin to let that go and as I have my own learning journey, and um, as I think about this, when we learn anatomy, we really start by deconstructing the whole into discrete structures um, co and compartments. And so um, that guy on the left is uh, Prince Ivan, and um, he was one of my first helpers. And I, I kind of like the idea of um, everything, uh, what, what's that saying, how does it go? Um, everything you need to know you learn in kindergarten um, so, <laughs> and and you do it you did it on a felt board and so I had this idea to create a felt a, a wool blanket with felt pieces and um, that I could put on him and he was such a trooper um, and um, you know after I finished it I saw a few little changes I would make but anyway um, I have this blanket still and it's just super cool because we can begin to um, see what's under the skin and it helps us but it, but it's really a process of deconstructing and naming and simplifying and compartmentalizing to help us to understand and so you know we have all the bones and the skeleton over here and when we were kids thinking about humans there's that that silly little song you know the toe bones connected to the foot bone i'm not a singer but you know how it goes you know when you yes. get from, from the toe to the head um and yet, I kind of think what can happen when we are embarking on this process to help ourselves learn what's underneath, we can get our brains sort of locked into simple linear connections and then to think or conclude that that's the only thing that's connected, you know, between the toes and the foot, that's it. 
um, and, and that we can kind of um, preclude the idea that there are some more distant um, interconnected attachments. And as we go through this process, every part gets dumped into its own little circle bucket. And, um, you know, we got bones and cartilage and ligaments and, you know, there's more than that, but, but just uh, to put a few on there. Um, and so we do this separation by type and we particularly do that with muscles, ligaments, and tendons. And, um, you know, we tell ourselves about what their geography is and where their beginnings and endings, the origin and insertions, what their function is. And so I just picked something. <clears throat> I picked the lower leg. And then from the lower leg, we've got the superficial and superficial and deep digital flexor tendons. And then that runs into the gastrox. And then that runs into our biceps femoris and, and semitendinosis. And, um, and so, you know, when we think about each of those, the anatomy books tell us that there are super discrete origins and insertions. And I kind of tell you when I learned that, I actually learned it like this picture. And it was like this one, the, um, the biceps femoris had connections the, at, at its origins and its insertions. And that my little brain, when I did that, somehow told me that even though the um, bicep fem lived sort of in the same neighborhood as the semitendinosis, they each had their very own little piece of real estate that was its own origin and its own insertion. And it wasn't playing with anybody who was next to it, which maybe I'm the only brain that does that. But this, this process of compartmentalizing, I mean, first of all, just to be transparent, when I first started my journey of learning body work, we were, we, we were compelled and I wanted to um, learn anatomy. And man, I, I like didn't realize how stupid I had become and how lazy my brain had become and how inept my brain had become at um, acquiring and retaining new information and new knowledge. And so um, maybe that was just a middle-aged brain um, problem overlying this topic of learning discrete muscles, but they stayed super discrete for me. Um, and so, you know, it occurs to me that the a challenge with this deconstruction and segmental reconstruction is that we might not have learned or we might not understand, or we might have a hard time remembering or believing that the beginnings and endings and edges and structural separateness aren't as crisp in the body as they might be in our minds, like they were in mine, and as they certainly are in the anatomy books. And um, so um, the question is, I think I might've jumped to slides. No. Nope. Um, <clears throat> so if they're, if they're, if the tissue keeps going, then what does that mean? And for, you know, it was exciting, but also sort of um, overwhelming when I first began thinking about this. And um, I guess if you're new out there to thinking about how all the stuff that you learned that were little tiny marbles are actually uh, marbles of anatomy are not really little tiny marbles. They're actually all connected. Um, and, um, and that's confusing. It's okay because everything we know about the discrete anatomic structures, um, we keep that. And then we just draw the curtains of the anatomy stage back and we start adding in how the fascial connections are and, um, and build on, uh, a, and create an understanding of, of fascia and fascial connectivities. Um, there are a variety of names out there. Some people call them fascial planes, like as in how, how airplanes go, like this plane and that plane, um, or, or trains or lines. I call them freeways. Um, it doesn't really matter uh, which, but um, understanding how fascia and fascial connectivities sets each discrete anatomic structure into the context of the entire body system as a whole. Um, and Becky, and you know, I, I think it's important, like anatomy can be so overwhelming. There's so much to it that 
one right. has to think that they they came up with at least naming origin insertion so they could have a conversation so it could at least have a dialogue of some agreement but i i'm totally with you in that it it overlooks the connectivity of everything but it does help us on one level at least have an understanding so there's uh, as you know there's value in learning mm -hmm. that system but there's value in not getting stuck in that system and i think that's kind exactly of really that that word that stuck word was the word that was in my head and that's super cool because fashion can get stuck so it's a good exactly so i was thinking <laughs> <laughs> so so we don't want to be stuck in our um in our knowledge it's super good it creates an amazing foundation um but if we're stuck in the discreteness of each muscle, then we can, as a body worker, I'm telling you, I did it, been there, done it. Um, I can get stuck on a particular body part or a particular muscle because the, the motion I'm asking for, I might be asking for the front limb to go down and back. And we in the Masterson world call that scapular release down and back. Um, but when I'm first learning it, I might get all like totally stuck about one particular muscle when the real problem might be super far away. Um, so it's super good to uh, pull the curtain back. And, and um, so I, I said this already, you know, it's really good to learn the, the discrete structures, but um, <clears throat> it did cause me for a while to lose track of this interconnectivity. And um, the person who drew the curtains back for me was um, the late Dr. Carrie Ridgway. And I um, just was super lucky, super, super fortunate to be able to go to his um, integrative veterinary medicine. It was a four day clinic. And that punched a bunch of doors open in my, um, my little closed mind. And it was super fun. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I wanted to just give you all a snapshot of some of my fascia books, um, my favorites at the moment, and um, you know, y'all can review it and get it later. Um, we start jumping over into the horse world. This is the brand new version of the Anatomy Trains book, and at the very back, there's some information about quadrupeds, um, including horses. Um, this book right here by um, Tulia, uh, has some information, Tuli and Mika has some information in the back. This by Mary Wanless has information. And then, of course, um, Pamela Ackelbarger's um, um, Kinetic Meridian. So those are, those are some of my super favorites. Um, this is just sort of a commercial for those of you that want to, you know, now that I've said, y'all need to know more, um, he, here's some resources. That's the point of these two slides. <clears throat> if you want to learn about um, equine fascia in person, then people I'm aware of are Lori Muller, Pamela Eckelbarger, and Diane Zingle at their, um, their learning center, Sharon Mae Davis and Dr. Ivana Ruddock in their dissections, and then um, Tulia and Mika have this um, animal fascial manipulation courses. Uh, they've not run any here in the United States, but it's worth, it's worth the travel. Um, Lori happens to be having a course coming up, so if you're, um, she, she does lots of information about fascia. So, um, okay, commercial is over. So um, perhaps y'all understand about fascia, but you know, all those books that I just had up there, um, you know, if we stacked them all up, I don't know, what, what is it like two feet tall? Whole lot of words, whole lot of pictures reduced to this one little slack. <laughs> okay, so that is to say, this is not it, but there's, um, here's a brief little overview. So it's the soft tissue component of the connective tissue system. It permeates the whole body. It is super stunning. And I, we're going to click out of here in a minute and go look at two little videos. But um, it's, a, it's a network of microscopic, hollow, transparent, fluid-filled tubules that connect everything to everything. These, um, this web of tubules interpenetrates and surrounds everything, organs, muscles, ligaments, tendons, bones, arteries, veins, nerves, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it creates a unique environment where all of that stuff uh, does its job. Um, it forms a whole body, continuous, never ending, never disconnected, except if there's injury. Um, Three-dimensional matrix of interconnection and structural support. 
So um, when I first saw this little short excerpt, you can see it's a three minute um, video that was created by Dr. Jean-Claude Gimberto. Um, and it's called Strolling Under the Skin. And when I saw that, it caused me to be, uh, have a mind blowing awareness of what was actually happening under there. And what I want to do is just stop this for a second. And I want to go share, um, I want to go share that video. How do I get my desktop? You need to get to your browser. Yeah, how do I do that? Are you using Safari? Are you Mac? Yeah, no, so it's, what is it? Google Chrome is where I want to go. Okay. Um, so if you're on a Mac, you could go down to your uh, mission control and find it on your menu yeah. bar at the bottom. Okay. How do I get to the share part? Uh, can... Screen share. So if you, you've got to go to screen share and you're going to see yeah. instead of your PowerPoint. Oh, there I see it. I see yep. it. I see yep. it. I see it now. <clears throat> don't tell me failed. I don't want to fail. Don't worry. I won't smoke. I don't smoke anymore anyway. <laughs> Optimize the video clip. Um, okay. Talk among yourselves out there. Just hold on. Yep. Well, you know what? It's, um, so it's, while Becky's trying to find that, I just want to say that we're working on some of those people that she had listed as guests on webinars with Wendy. Um, and we'll probably go after a few more of those now that we've seen Becky's list, because it's always fun to have new people talking about um, different aspects of the same thing. Okay, so where do you need help, Becky? Well, I can see oh, desktop. You got it. It's coming up. Okay. To share your computer audio, please. I don't want to do that. No. Nope. Um, I don't want to do that. Uh, that looks like your PowerPoint. Yeah. Well, it's not letting me do that. Yeah. So if okay. you just unshare your screen, let's see if we can walk you through once. We'll try it. All if right. that doesn't work, we'll unshare your screen. Stop sharing. Do you yes. have the Chrome browser up, ready to go with the video page open? I do. Okay. So go to screen share on zoom or share screen the green button and you should have little thumbnails and you can choose the thumbnail that looks like the chrome browser with that page open yeah um yes. it was telling me i had to put a pass a look did that work can y'all see yeah. it yeah we're good now just make that big and play it will be awesome uh your lips are moving but i can't hear you oh um can you make it big um, Oops. Oh, just no, on your browser, you could have done that. Now I can't hear you. Uh oh. Uh, anyway, hang on. I'll just text you here. Uh, you had it. <laughs> just make it big and hit play. I don't know why she can't hear me. I'm not muted. Oh, you know what? Take the time to do this. Here's okay. what I'll do I'll go back to my presentation and share and. Um, so everybody, your homework is to go Google Fashion Magnified 25 times. This one that's three minutes and 11 seconds is a good one. It's got some subtitles. If you're like me, you won't want to listen to the music. So just turn your little sound down. Um, and what we can see right here is um, fascia tubules. And so at the underneath this play arrow, right directly underneath it, you see this thick piece that looks like one yep. it's a big fat eye it's a ruse it's not one that is multiple you can see here here's one two three and this one over here off to the right has split off what you can see in the video is that um, these things they they this thing that looks like one will split off and suddenly you have more than one and that was when I saw that I said to myself, we're looking at restriction and the removal of restriction. And um, what we can see on this little tubule here is that there's liquid on the outside of it. 
And there, in this tubule up to the right that's heading off toward like one o'clock, you can see little, little droplets. That's fluid inside the tubule. And so we can see right here in this long one that's at a diagonal with all those little tubules that are, that are mushed together, we could imagine that the, the guy in the middle, let's imagine there's one guy in the, one tubule in the middle and then six tubules all around it. That one in the middle isn't gonna have the benefit of the fluid running around it because the tubules are beside it. And so we, we um, it's, a, it's a dilemma when there's restriction. Hey, um, Becky, Becky, I can share my screen. If you unshare, I pull it up. Okay. So we can at least watch part of it. Okay. This is, this is like t tag team here. Perfect. <laughs> Cool. So you can, can you can see it, right? Yep. You can talk yep. us through it. Yeah. So look at that big guy right there in the middle. That's not one. And that guy off to the left. That's not one. Um, there you can see the 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 um, the fluid like up here on the top. You see those little bubbles of fluid. And look look at that little fluid right there. Right there. Oh, yeah. Now that is an intersection. Well, it's gone now. Oh look, that's separating. You see, and look at how you can see um, the, the little arms that are connected between tubule left and tubule right. Um, uh, the, the fascia is just so stinking amazing because it, it'll have, um, like, if you look at my, um, can they see my hand? Yeah, they can see your hand. Maybe not. Um, it's like a coupling sleeve. Um, mule. And, and this coupling sleeve that's my left hand here and see like there's my, my wrist, okay? It will slide, one manifestation of it is that it will slide along. It's just so cool. So here we have a little vein in the middle of fascia. Um, this is the part about fascias around everything. Um, this is super possible to see fluid going through the tubules right there and that what that little v right there is going to split off when you when you watch it oh look and now we're backing out okay that's live fascia and he we're coming out of the um the guy's arm me, 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 me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so stop it here because there's a different one that we'll watch later so so like so fascia is sort of sheet like but then it has all these tubules and you can see the fluid running through all that that's crazy well yeah and the thing is it only becomes sheet like when there's an army of tubes okay so the thing is is there are um there are different presentations different manifestations of this word we call fascia um i lost the picture of me am i still there you're still there because you? you made your you're sharing your screen now so what's the fluid is the fluid just water inside the fascia you know one of our vets could answer my brain tells me that a, at least a piece of it is um hyaluron and um but i have to um say that i uh i knew but i forgot and that happens it's okay to me that happens um, yeah it does um so, you know, just to kind of give an airplane view, fascia is the stuff that envelops everything, literally everything, and it connects everything to everything. And so, you know, from our perspective in the horsey world, this means that whether we're sitting on a horse's back or making contact with a bit in its mouth, or we're doing body work with its tail, or we're inviting it to stand on surefoot pads, the fact is that because of fascia, Wherever you are, you are everywhere else. Everything is connected. And um, so if we step back for a second to, and think about what we, I just said, but we think about those discrete muscles. And, um, and I said a little while ago that the beginnings and endings and edges are not as crisp in the body as we said they were in the books. You know, what, what does that mean? Um, well, the short non-science answer is that 
the tissues are interconnected and they keep going. And there's a next slide that, that I show you a road, but um, you know, the uh, Tom Myers, one of the giants in this topic, he has some terminology that's kind of helpful. So myofascia is simply a bundling together of myo, which is muscle, and its web of connective to fascia. So myofascial. Um, myofascial continuity, he uses to, to mean two or more adjacent connected myofascial structures. And then he uses a term called roundhouse, which is kind of what happens at bony landmarks, like the tuber coxa or pelvis. Um, <clears throat> and that's where myofascial continuity, so two or more myofascial structures, come together at a roundhouse. And then a station are locations where myofascial continuity or tracks um, in an outer myofascial bag are sort of tacked down into fascial webbing. So, um, to, uh, of a lig ligament bag. And so, you know, my, uh, where my brain went when I was learning all this anatomy in its discrete beginnings and endings, origin and, and insertions, um, that all sort of goes away when we introduce fascia, which, you know, the anatomists and sometimes the surgeons are like, that crap's got to just get out of the way. I just need to clear all that white fuzzy stuff out because I need to get to the thing, whatever the thing is, or it's a bone or a muscle or an organ or whatever, like get all this fuzzy stuff out of the way. Well, uh, that's actually a problem. I mean, might, they might functionally have to do that in order to do their job, but, um, but we now understand that it is a net inside of which structures uh, rest. Um, and so now I can imagine, and it's helped by having been to a few dissections because you can see it live. And of course, there's no like end of structure A and beginning of structure B. No, it doesn't work that way. They go like that. Okay, they're actually sort of interdigitated and they're tacked down at stations and roundhouses, they're tacked down, but they're still together. And so I, I think in pictures and, and in geography. And so in reality, the path of that, those leg structures that I showed you several slides ago, the path up the back of the leg is kind of like the drive from Colgara down here in the south to Darwin up here in the north. And look, we have Highway 87, Highway 87, Highway 87, Highway 1, Highway 81. But you know what? It's the same stinking road. It's the same road. And it just has um, three different numbered highways that transition at the road houses or stations. But it continues on. Um, and so I think of freeways and automobiles, and if we look at this, these, um, these structures for our cars on the left, and then we look at these structures on the right, which are screen grabs um, from Dr. Gamberto's book, um, there's some super similarities. Uh, it's amazing, actually, how, because I just drove through 66, where they're doing all this construction and rebuilding all those highways, and that's, <laughs> that's what it looks like with the overpasses. So that's, that's a really interesting way to view it, is the highways, and then all yeah. the, yeah, awesome. I love that yeah. analogy. And then guess what? When we have some idiot who does something stupid, and they crash, and then all the people behind that car either crash into it or can't go forward. And then the further idiots go in the opposite direction who simply need to slow down and watch. All of that is restriction. So it happens on the highways and it happens in our body. And so for me, my brain kind of likes this terminology of freeways because I can think about getting from, you know, if I was going to come catch up with you and come out, come and play, I, I would think about different highways. Um, they might have different names depending on what county or state I'm in, but it's the same one going from here to there. And I might have to like go through a roundabout and hang, you know, shoot off to the left um, and connect with some little town. So for me, that analogy uh, works for my brain. 
So um, I use fascial freeways. And this image on the left is Tom Meyer's depiction of uh, the fascial freeway that he calls the superficial back line. Um, just to tell you, um, Tom Meyer's background um, in part was he was uh, um, trained by Ida Rolfs. You know all of this, I think, um, Wendy. Uh, but I don't know the exact story of how it happened, but he got connected with a fellow who does human dissections. And from his work, uh, his body work with um, Ida Rolfs and her teaching, he understood that when he was um, working on someone's foot, there may be an impact in their head or in their neck. And did so he, he also work with Dr. Feldenkrais? He may, yes, he did. I believe he did. Yeah. I, be, I believe he did. And, and um, yeah, so, so he, knowing what he knew uh, experientially with his body work, the notion of discrete compartmentalized uh, anatomic structures didn't fit with what he experienced in the body work. So he, I don't know how, got connected with this human uh, person, the person who did human dissections. And he worked with that person to come up with an entirely different dissection protocol. It was not a discrete structure by structure dissection. It was a, hey, what do you think could happen if we started at one end and went to the other end? But the rules of the game are, you have to follow the grain of the tissue that you start with, and you have to stay on the plane that you start with. You can't dive deeper. You can, so, so you're, you're, you're just going to go that way. And when they did that, they, and I didn't include it because some people get queasy, but you can find it if you go look out there or in his book. Um, there, they actually were able to dissect from the tippity tops of the underneath side of the toes, all the way up the back, using their dissection rules and protocols, all the way up to the back, all the way up the back of the head, and ending at the tip of the um, eyebrows. That's one freeway of interconnected muscle and tendon and ligaments. And, <clears throat> So I uh, will talk in a little bit about um, Dr. Vivica Elbrand, and she was, you know, about be, I became a fascia geek, and then I became a fascia addict, and um, you saw that list of folks. And so my modus operandi for learning was to come up with my bucket list of people and then stuck them and figure out how to get to them and get training with them. And so um, Dr. Elbrand was one of the keynote speakers at Jillian Higgins' uh, annual symposium seminar about four years ago, I think. And so I had to go. So I went and um, during her uh, presentation out in the barn, um, the horses didn't want to play. <laughs> so she had two painted horses with a superficial, the dorsal backline, she calls it something different, dorsal, dorsal backline, I think she's what she calls it. and. Um, that horse, she, she kept trying to get up to it and that horse said, you can come and I kick you. And so that horse and the other horse were excused. And so here she is standing there with another 45 minutes to talk. So she asked for three people from the stands to come down. And this is mind blowing to me. The, care, the criteria for the, for the three people were when the person bent down in the direction of their toes, one person she wanted who could only get their hand to about their knees. Another person she wanted who could only get their hand to about the front of their chins. Shins, not chins. And the final person, they could not get quite to the ground. And so, you know, we had three volunteers. They all came down into the dirt and stood out there in front of 300 people or so. And so the person who could only t bend over to their knees, the job she gave that person, for, and each of them had to do this for two minutes once she said go. So the, the person who could bend the least, she gave the job of like just rubbing their scalp like as if they were washing their hair. The person who could go to the middle, they get that person she gave the job of rubbing um, up and down um, on her lumbar. And the person who could go the furthest, she gave the job of, of rubbing at the Achilles heel. And so she's like, you got it? They're like, yeah, so ready, go. 
So they are, you know, doing their looking silly for two minutes. And then, oh, before she did that, she asked them all to demonstrate, to bend over. And of course, you know, they could bend only as far as they could bend. And so then they spent two minutes and then she said, okay, now try again. To a person, their fingers were in the dirt. Shocking. The most shocking was the person who was standing there looking silly, rubbing their head. Um, but the thing is, is tension and restriction migrates and we can relieve and release tension along fascial lines. That, that is a real, I have to try that experiment. That sounds like so you much fun to do with people. It's, I do it. I do it in my classes, you know? I'm like, okay, let's have some volunteers to see what will happen. That, yeah. You know, I recently did that. Actually, um, uh, Lori Muller and I uh, share a client and we go tag teaming together and, um, and uh, se several, they actually queued up of the guys who were grooms um, after we'd been there for a week. They're like, ah, uh, yeah, I got a problem. Um, so <laughs> this, <laughs> this one fellow, he was having trouble bending over. And I'm like, okay, here, just try this. You know, I set my watch and, and you know, he literally could only bend over to his knees. It was just like that. And, and I'm like, just do that. And he, the whole time, his like lips are chattering. He's telling me I'm silly. It's not gonna work, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, okay, you're done. Bend over on the ground. Wow. <laughs> It's 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 a okay. Super I'm definitely practice. gonna have to do this party trick because I love party tricks for my <laughs> clinics. Love it. It's a super fun party trick. Um, so uh, Tom <laughs> and um, and in his efforts with his dissection protocol, um, <laughs> identified twelve fascial trains. Um, there 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 are four of them here. <clears throat> the superficial back line superficial front line, the spiral line, the functional line. Um, I don't know if it's because I can relate to my own body um, better than I can relate to a horse's body, but it has helped me. And I'm gonna show you some depictions of horse fascial lines or fascial freeways. Um, but <clears throat> when I was first starting to expand my brain, it was easier for me to think about these fascial trains, fascial freeways in my own body than it was for me to think about the horsey body. And so I would think about it in my own body and then I would like bend over and go, wait, okay. It's like this part on me and I bent over. Okay, so it's that part on them and here's where it goes. Um, so perhaps that's, um, if you wanna learn more about this, you can um, get more information from Tom. But, um, Two doctors in Denmark, Dr. Vivica Elbron and Dr. Rika Schultz, used Tom Meyer's fascial dissection protocol rules and applied them to dissections of horses. I think it was 21 horses. And their question was, can we find similar fascial lines, planes, trains, whatever you want to call it? Um, and they believe they did. And they documented 10 of them. So that was in 2014. And their public, their, their research was published in 2015. Dr. Carrie Ridgway heard them speak in 2014 and came home and applied that knowledge to his work and knowledge. And Pamela Eckelbarger and I went to that four day symposium with Dr. Ridgway in 2015. And so um, Pamela began working with Dr. Ridgway and created for her own brain and also to help Dr. Ridgway with his work, um, her uh, depictions that you have seen um, of, of their, Dr. Vivica Elbron's and Rika Schultz's research combined with uh, Dr. Ridgway's research to help Pamela understand what the heck was going on. I am so glad you've explained this because Pamela will never blow her own horn and tell us how this came about. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, if you go to this website down here, there's a super ton of information and detail about that. And, um, and uh, Pamela is, well, she calls, her, calls herself Poindexter, so I can just do it. Um, she, she's amazing. And, 
Um, she's an amazing researcher and she is a gatherer of knowledge and information and resources. If you have not connected with her on Facebook through her, um, her Facebook page for the um, Equisoma, I forget what it's called, we'll see it later, yeah. um, then you're missing out. Um, so <clears throat> the, uh, I picked four of Pam's images to depict four of um, Dr. Elbron and Schultz call it myofascial kinetic lines. Now we know myofascia, we heard about that before. It's muscle and fascia and kinetic movement lines. Okay, blah, 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 freeway. <laughs> um, but we can see that this superficial back line, if we could see the whole thing, looks mysteriously similar to the human Tom Myers dissected superficial back line. So superficial dorsal line equals superficial back line. Superficial front line in Tom Myers human world equals superficial ventral line in the horsey world. The lateral line, there's a lateral line in, in humans, and then the front lines, um, front limb lines are similar to the arm lines. Um, so, um, so we're beginning to kind of uh, be educated based on veterinary research and um, researcher uh, knowledge and artistic depictions of how we move from those individual discrete anatomic in the anatomy book sections to, well, what's connected to what? And so if there are these connections, and there are, then what would the effect be of an injury or some sort of limited or improper movement? I've had a lot of limited and improper movement during COVID. It looks a lot like being a sloth, <laughs> okay? <laughs> this is not good for our fascia. <laughs> but um, what's the effect of that? Um, the short answer is that uh, migrating restriction. And we saw we had a little image from the short little video that you were able to connect us to. We can see in our mind's eye now, since we have seen live fascia, what that looks like. It looks like tubules that are supposed to be individual, all mooshed together. So it can be, fascia can begin to bind together uh, when the fluid filled tubules get sticky. Sticky adhered together tubules lead to sticky, stucky fluid, both inside and outside the tubules. Thus, tissues which should slide and glide, extend and recoil, begin not to. And then tissues under tension, all of them, muscles, tendons, nerves, ligament, everybody is surrounded by tissue. They no longer move freely alongside, at the, the, on their own and alongside others. Um, beside who, which, whatever, they should be slippy, slidey, and glidey to their appropriate glide maximum, whatever that's supposed to be, whatever the rule book says it's supposed to be. Um, and worse yet, if we have, think about that picture again in that video in your mind's eye, think about a whole bunch of that stuff inside of which is like a nerve, for example. And now suddenly we have entrapment in fascial nets that are supposed to be all slippy and slidey and glidey and permissive, and they're not, right? So that leads to stiffness and tightness and compression, and that leads to horses that are like, or humans, or goats or whatever, bent, which leads to postural imbalances. And all of that results in impairments to normal movement trajectories. We want to be in balance. And our um, bones and joints have a particular, like if, we, if there was, a, if there was a, um, a user's manual, a design spec manual for the body, it would be like, this should be like over top of that, and it should go like that. And if it's like this, then you're gonna have rubbing and grinding in places that that shouldn't be. Um, so we have impairments to normal movement trajectories. We have reduced freedom of movement. 
and we have limitations to range of motion. And those can be like truly um, biomechanic restrictions. Uh, and that has nothing to do with pain. There may or may not be pain. There may or may not be inflammation. It's just simply like, you know, if I went like this on my shirt, like I would have to, that, that's putting pressure over here. There's just, there's going to be, I'm going to like start sitting funny if my fascia inside of me is doing that. Um, so <clears throat> all of that is going to lead to compensatory restrictions uh, that are knock-on restrictions that have nothing to do with whatever the original issue is. It's just a cascade and a migration along and between fascial freeways. So, you know, like if we, if we, I'm looking at my pond out here. If I took one pebble rock and I threw it in the pond, we know, we can imagine, we know what would happen, right? Ding, 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 ding. Okay, so if along the way, if it's doing that, and then let's just say there's a big boulder sticking up outside of it. So this nice little happy little blop, 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 bumps into the boulder. Now, what happens? Blink, 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 blink. Now we have, now we have rings crashing into rings, crashing into other rings. And, and so um, you, you get, because in part, because of these fascial freeways, you get uh, migrating restrictions, not only because of the initial issue, but also because of com compensation which is occurring, like I just said, if I go like this and I need to have my head go that way, that's gonna create some knock-on effects. So this has been around a while. Fascial tension is a different story for everyone, but it's also everywhere inside of a body. So all of these folks are saying, my back is killing me. Um, and this guy on the end is saying, my back and my knee too. Um, but there's lots of ways we could experience this, um, uh, that we could interpret this. But if we simply look at the, um, the anatomic structures, the first guy on the left has something going on in his shoulder and then look down here, don't miss what's going on with that left foot. And then this guy over here still has stuff going on uh, on that same side of his neck, but now his pelvis is wonky and, and his right leg is all wonky. The left leg appears to be fine. It's not, but anyway. Um, and then, the one on the, uh, the second from the end, he's got something going on, on the left side of his head and the whole left side of his body. And that reaches up and grabs his ribs on both sides and his pelvis. And look how wonky he is. I mean, the whole thing wonky. Um, that's, what, that's what tension migration does. Um, so what I wanted to do is, um, this is a minute and a half and, and actually include the voice because the lady who voiceovers this um, does a really good job of talking and it's super like freaky how you can see things moving and see restriction. So can, can we try that? I'll stop sharing. Just, so go okay. to that same one, go to that yep. same um, place you went, but pick the one that's like one minute. I've got it. Okay. I just, I've been muted because of the background sound where I am. So <laughs> I keep, okay, you should see this on your screen now, right? And I'm gonna make sure that the sound is up. I don't hear anything yet. Um, okay, so we can't hear her, but what we were seeing was a tendon in a tendon sheath. Oh, that great. first part was sliding through a fascial sleeve. Why don't you have sound? Can you hear me? I can hear you. So why don't you have sound on that? Because uh, I have sound on it. Uh, Okay, I'm going to try this again to see if we can get the sound, okay? Okay. I'm going to just pull my headset out and play it again. Okay. Let me know what if you have sound. What we see is a tendon yes. sliding underneath the fascial sleeve. It looks like saran wrap. It shares a blood supply, and without restriction, it slides easily. Then what we're seeing is the fascia pulled up from the tendon, magnified 25 times. Now we can see the little individual fibers binding together to form restriction and big tree trunks rather than each individual fiber. 
and it will only come apart with sustained traction as you see in this example this one little string comes apart from the rest the whole system is very fluid filled and quite well hydrated in its healthy state but you can see how it binds together and creates restriction in the center of the screen you'll see fascial release and then off to the left, another piece comes up and in the background, a whole fascial plane starts to let go. It's like a tectonic plate. Then there's elongation of one of the fibers. This is an example of how the vascular system is buried in the fat and fascia. And when the fascia clamps in, in the dear God, we're gonna die response, the purpose is to inhibit and squeeze these blood vessels so that if you get cut, you don't bleed too much. It squeezes your nerves so that if you get hurt, you don't feel it right away. You can see how beautiful these little fibers are when they're individualized and how they're fluid filled. See the water flowing up the tubule? These are fiber optics that conduct consciousness throughout your body, sharing information about proprioception. It's a beautiful thing. Wow. Okay. Right, let's unshare my screen here. Okay. Okay. That, that was super cool. <laughs> I know. Crazy time. <clears throat> okay. So we just saw one um, depiction of, of restriction. Um, and to just review, here's a couple of specific examples of complications. Um, so, body suppleness and leg movement is compromised when there's restriction anywhere in the axial or appendicular skeleton. That's going to result in joint range of motion becoming restricted, um, whether near or far, and it can become tight and impaired. And so, frictions, fascia's frictionless be glide becomes a stickier slide. And then muscles' natural ability to fully contract or relax can be reduced. Um, so this makes sense. Um, is tension and restriction regional or this is not? Oh, yeah. Um, is it regional or, um, or not? Um, the horse is a, or remote, the horse is a prey animal. So tension, pain, and restriction for our purposes, you know, it's super important to know that they're only going to re be revealed when the it, whatever the it is that's causing that becomes so bad that the horse can no longer conceal it. And one thing for us to recall, think about those skeleton men standing there. Um, those skeleton men, you know, it could be that the guy who had that something going on on that left foot, maybe that's where it was screaming but the problem was actually in his back. So um, when you, know, you have a horse, either because you own it and the horse, you, know, you see that there's some issue, um, just know that it may or may not be the source of what the body's dilemma is. Um, it, it, it's gonna begin locally and regionally, but it'll immediately begin to migrate. And, and often it'll be along predictable fascial lines. Um, and so a primary issue in one body region is going to result in some sort of compensatory tension in some number of other body regions near and or far. So how do we find them? Um, there's a myriad of ways and, and um, modalities. You, you know, the one that I teach is the Masterson method. Um, we learn to have a conversation with the horse. I think a lot of the people who are on this call are Masterson people. Um, if you're not, we simply learn to ask questions of the horse's body and, and, we're, and we're searching for tension and restriction, all while staying under the horse's inclination to brace. And it goes back to um, the nature of the horse. Uh, we learn to listen with our eyes and our hands. And it becomes a conversation where we're inquiring. That's that same horse from the very beginning. Um, he was completely closed down, withdrawn, internal. When I walked up to him, he was like a super sad statue. Um, and here, this was him at the end, giving me little smoochers. Um, and so, you know, we have this gift of a conversation when we learn that we're gonna inquire and listen. The, the speaker in that video said that um, the fascia um, becomes uh, unrestricted with um, under tension. 
And that is one way, but I'll tell you, I am quite sure and I know that it can also um, be uh, relieved, let's say that, or reduced um, simply by the presence of our hands and sometimes even remotely. Um, so, you know, when we, when we get rid of tension and restriction, we get, we improve, we make improvements to the body, um, but we also get this cool relationship. Um, I'm not going to talk a long time about this, but basically what, what the Masterson method is, is that we, we connect our touch um, with the horse's responses to our touch. And we're doing that in key junctions of the body that most affect performance in order that we can find and release tension. Um, just in case anybody doesn't know, um, it, it, is, it is not a replacement for veterinary assessment. You know, this is, this is the, the um, you know, we don't, we don't do work if, if a vet should be called. Um, so you can see that. Um, you know, uh, when we think about tension and restriction, um, a horse's first choice is to run, but we have them living for the most part in a situation where running is not an option including when we're working with them. And so their second choice is to, is to brace or push or kick um, and guard against in, intrusion. And, and even when they're doing that, um, that in and of itself could create um, tension and, and restriction, which finds its way into the horse's body. Um, but when we are doing this Masterson work, we learn to bypass it um, and, and to apply different levels of presence or pressure so as not to trigger it. Um, the, um, the part about finding and releasing tension, we, we actually work with the nature of the horse and um, they want the protection of the herd. Their communication is subtle and sometimes not so subtle. They follow the leader and mirror. Um, these are all uh, attributes of the horse that we learn about and learn to assimilate into our demeanor and the way in which we have this um, come search and destroy, but in a very light conversation um, where we're, we're trying to find and get rid of the tension and restriction. Um, we just always have to remember that the horse has a survival need not to show any pain. And so, you know, their tooth, the whole truth and nothing but not the truth, but concealment is the way that they, um, they live. Um, we, the process we use to find tension, um, and restriction is, it's super interesting. And at the very back end of this, there's a two pages of, that somebody could um, print, but um, to go off and try one technique of the Masterson method for themselves. But this is the key. Thinking about the nature of the horse, um, we search with the presence of our hand um, underneath the horse's ability to brace against our presence. Um, we search for, uh, a places where the horse's body responds. And um, there are things like blinks or twitches or lip quivers or breathing changes. Um, and when we find it, with, particularly with the one technique later, um, you just stop, you pause in place and you wait. And so if we were to do that in the place where we think back to that video a second ago where there was tension and restriction, if that was happening, at this part of my hand and I came along da, 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 and then I blinked. I would simply stop and leave my hand here. And what would happen if the camera was still rolling is those in the presence of the presence of our hand and the heat and the energy, by the way, bonking through, um, that restricted um, tubules would become unrestricted. Um, so, uh, we just stay, 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 um, and then we get to see that the horse does releases. Um, this is super logical. Where does tension and restriction accumulate in the horse? Same place it does with us. Head and neck, shoulders, um, thorax, low back, back end. Duh. Okay. So, what I wanted to do is look at equine myofascial kinetic lines, fascial freeways, and see if we could go find and follow some restrictions. And um, so we're gonna begin with bones. Uh, and I love the hyoid apparatus, the same four day event where I became, at, with Dr. Ridgeway, where I became a fascia addict, I also became a hyoid apparatus addict. Um, <clears throat> so 
there's a little baby. It's super small. That one was like this big. It was really tiny. Um, a, a super small hyoid apparatus. You can see where it lives inside the mandible in the middle picture and then a, a side view on that other one. Um, I snatched some um, images out of the ABC of the horse atlas and um, we can see uh, one of my super favorite muscles, the occipitohyoid muscle, that little baby one right there. Um, and then the omohyoid muscle. Uh, and then off to the right, we have the sternohyoid and the sternothyroid. Um, and we can see that it's like a swing thing. It's kind of like a three-dimensional, I know you've had a bunch of stuff on hyoid and, um, and, and I just think it's super important. Um, I also, I think about it in part like a three-dimensional um, uh, wishbone, you know, the thing you want to rip apart. At <laughs> at Thanksgiving, um, you're just gonna add a couple of extra pieces. And um, the um, if we were saying that little kitty song, you know, the high bone connects to the, uh, the answer is just about everything. Directly and indirectly through fascial freeways. These two images on the left here are um, a depiction of a different uh, group of folks um, research and conclusions about fascial lines. That's um, Tulia Luamala and Mika Pillman. They are from, uh, I get them mixed up, Norway, Iceland, one of those places up there. I should know, because I went there, can't remember. Um, and um, their training <clears throat> came through Italy, and so a different, a, a different dissection theory through um, Luigi Stecco and Carla Stecco. So they're of the Stecco model of freeway analysis. Um, and so these are their lines. And if we look at, so they kind of attach this superficial back line with the arm line and call that a single line. Um, <clears throat> so if we look at theirs and we look at, at four muscles, the tongue, the occipitohyoid, that one I pointed out with that, with that little baby one, the omohyoid and the sternohyoid. If we just look at those four, and then we look at the blue lines that are depicted in the back, in this back line. Oh, you know what? I grabbed the same image, sorry. This, that one of those was supposed to be the front line. So I'll fix it, but anyway, nobody will be able to see it. Just imagine, just imagine that this line doesn't go over the top, just like that one, that it goes underneath the bottom. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> it, it is like a front line. So just pretend in your own little head that it goes on, that it's like this, the, the human superficial front line. Um, so looking at that, um, if we could, the hyoid direct connections are the tongue, the skull, the sternum, the thorax, and the shoulder. Those are the direct ones. The indirect connections via fascia and fascial freeways in the bottom line in this image you can't see, um, you connect to ribs four to eight, the pubis via the deep pectoral and rectus abdominal muscles and many more. And the top line you get from that little baby muscle that I love to the occiput, which gets you to the nuchal and supraspinous ligaments, which gets you to all of the DSPs, of the thorax and then the lumbar and the sacrum and the pelvis and the tibia and the hock via the supraspinous ligament and the semitendinosus and much more. So for me, the hyoid apparatus is kind of like the center of the universe because it is central to most of the life supporting body functions. It's, it's central to breathing with direct support via the trachea and indirect connection with the diaphragm via the sternum, to eating, the, or the, tongue, the origin of the tongue is at the lingual process of the hyoid. Swallowing, it directly supports the esophagus. Hearing and vestibular balance because the tympanohyoid, the, the tympanohyoid, um, that little bone that attaches up to that tube that comes out the ear, that, that gets you straight to hearing and balance. Seeing um, the ocular uh, nerve um, is, is uh, articulating and communicating right there. And 
locomotion. We have direct connection with the omohyo to the front limbs and the thorax, fascial connection with the diaphragm, and then that from the diaphragm, you connect to the psoas and then onto the pelvis and the hind limbs. And you have fascial connections with the hind limb, the pelvis, and the entire axial skeleton. And frankly, everything else. Because once you connect to the diaphragm, you get connected with the ribs and the diaphragm has fascial connections to all the internal organs. So um, we, oh, and here's my picture book. It, it arrived and, and as you were trying to get me connected, I was like, woo, I can take a picture. <laughs> This is from Jillian Higgins' book that arrived, you know, four minutes before, um, before we came on. And look, you can color. So here is the sternohyoid attaching to the sternum, which then gets you to the abdominal, which gets you to the pelvis and gets you to the psoas. And there's all kinds of stuff that's not there. <laughs> so we don't even have the top line. Um, so um, it kind of gets it back to where I started, which is we can learn about the discrete anatomic structural units, but if we leave them in their little box, we don't take into account that if we were to just simply draw the curtains back, that we, um, we have connectivity to lots. Were you about to say something, Wendy? Well, I was, um, I was going to say that, you know, and obviously this connects down into the feet because that the, the feet, the legs are largely tendinous and that's just extensions of the fascia and the tendons and the, yes. yep, because whole deal. There's no crisp beginnings and endings. They interdigitate. So, you know, once you jump on a freeway, zoop, you're, you're everywhere. You're everywhere. You're, wherever you are, you're everywhere else. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Um, so if we think about this, this notion from a bodywork um, perspective, what are the implications? Um, here's just two baby little examples um, for masters and practitioners. And at the bottom, I say, for if you're not a masters and practitioner, just apply similar thinking to the modalities that you have. Or if you want to come play with us, come take a course. They're all over the world. Um, but two examples, if we think about scapular release down and forward. So that for us does not mean that the scapula is going forward. What we're, we're using the leg to draw the leg forward and release the scapula. But we call that scapular release down and forward because the leg is down and forward. But actually, the scapula is going back. You know, you all know that. When you, when you ask for the leg to go forward, the scapula goes sort of up and back. Okay. But so if, you, if you're having this conversation with the horse and you're like, hey, how does this work for you? You know, how does it work if I ask for your leg to go down and forward? And the horse is like, no, nah, we don't do that anymore. Um, so it, the, the question for you when, you, when you encounter that kind of stickiness and restriction, the first question in my mind is, is the tissue issue new? And so I might consider the flexor line, the back of the leg just like from the foot to the elbow. What's is, is when I'm asking for the thing to come forward, it, is the stickiness really close down by the feet? Um, alternatively, if I think about that, um, that uh, it's actually the spiral line, I think, I can't remember. Um, but if I think about inviting, let's say the left front leg down and forward, what happens to the opposite diagonal hind? When I invite that leg forward, does he have to pop up his hind foot in order for me to successfully with him get that front leg down and forward? If the opposite diagonal hind foot has to pop up, then the question is, is I think about, I think about rubber bands and someone stepping on it. Okay, so if there's a rubber band that goes up and diagonally across and over to the hind leg, who's the idiot that's standing on the rubber band? Where are they standing? And so places to ponder. You might ponder the latissimus. You might ponder the thoracolumbar fascia. You might ponder the opposite gluteal. You might ponder the semitendinosus. Those are things that you might consider if the horse is having trouble with your question of down and forward, 
when you see the opposite diagonal popping up. Alternatively, it could be, um, there are other lines, by the way, that could be underneath the belly line, so, but going to the opposite diagonal. So y'all think about what th that would be. And, um, but it, you could, what if the challenge is that you invite the left leg forward, but the, the same side hind leg pops up? Um, well, then you might consider the fascia that goes from the elbow to the cycle. Or you might consider hind end extensor dilemmas. And so just like expand your mind about, about where the guy might be stepping on the rubber band, <laughs> you know, when you're encountering trouble. Another example, scapular release down and back is sticky. So here we're asking for the leg to go back and the scapula to lift and kind of go forward. Um, so again, is the issue near? So here I would, I would consider um, the extensor line up to the shoulder. Um, I might, if, if I think that the issue might be, you know, under or on top of the scapula, the front of it, I might, I might consider um, putting my hands and testing the, the tissues on the cervical part of the trapezius or the cervical part of the serratus ventralis. If I think that it's more towards the head, then I might consider that, that muscle that goes from the head to the arm, the brachiocephalic, omo transversarius, or my personal go-to, the omo hyoid. So if I'm inquiring, hey, how does it work when I ask for your front leg to go down and back and the team of the front leg says, no, we don't do that anymore, um, then I immediately go do work up on releasing tension related to the omo hyoid and the hyoid apparatus. And then I'll double back and say, hey, did that work for you? Um, so those are just two super simple examples. Um, essentially, the issue is always in the tissue. And so when you encounter resistance or restriction, you can begin to melt locally and ponder fascial connections. What should be sliding along what? And who needs to extend and who's not? You can use body clues um, that you observe. Like I just said, is there an unweighting of hooves to facilitate some movement request? Is there touching or biting the uninvolved body part? Well, guess what? They're perhaps pointing. Hey, human, go over there. <laughs> Most of the time, when, when a horse touches something else, I'm like, good, thanks for letting me know. And I go there. I don't even know what's there. It doesn't matter because they're now feeling something. When I was asking one question, um, I'll go, oh, I don't know, maybe you got something, so I'll go there. So consider the mere collection connections and then ponder the further connections and use what you know. If you don't, it's okay if, if you don't know the anatomy yet. It's okay if you don't know the fascial lines yet, because you know what, you could cheat. Um, there's this horse anatomy app, it's super good. And you know, either when I don't know or when I forget, or when my um, middle-aged brain says, yeah, we're not doing that today, um, and that information is just simply unavailable to you, um, I will pull out my little, this guy right here, that guy right there. It's the Horse Anatomy app in 3D. The Horse Anatomy app in 3D. Okay, I'll type that in the yeah. chat. And Becky, I just wanna let you know that my battery is starting to run down. Yeah, we're getting close to the end. Okay. Um, so. Um, you can look it up real time while you're working and, um, and then say what's well, connected to what and who might be too tight or too hard. Um, just remember that fascia magnified 25 times video and the big takeaway is presence plus patience equals power. Yeah, most of the time don't need pushing. You just need presence. And this is a, with my thermal imaging camera, that's the back, the side of a horse and that is the hand of a man who put their hand on and then I quick snapped an image. Um, you can see the energy. You can see the heat that's in, been introduced. Now just imagine with your little mind, boop, it's going underneath, because it is. Um, I can send to you, if anybody wants it, they can email me. Um, this is the how-to to use um, this one technique. It's called the bladder meridian. Super interesting, it will teach you. The, the power of presence and patience. Um, and it's the how to, how to do that. 
Um, reducing restriction by leveraging all your knowledge, all your tools. I gotta tell you, my, my favorite go-tos are Masters of Method and Sure Foot Pads. Um, and um, I just love being able to incorporate them in, um, in a, a safe way and not on horses that shouldn't have it done. And you know, the appropriate disclaimers um, about not frying horses and having them be over stimulated. Right. Um, but the, the process and methodology of the work that we do combined with your amazing tool um, is, is super fun. Um, I threw this in here because tension restriction and fascial free race, everybody has them, even piggies. Um, and this was um, a super funny experience I had. And this was, his, his name was Nixon. And um, I got to tell you, I look like I all know what I'm doing here. My mind inside my head was like, you're a fraud. You're a fraud. You are such a fraud. And right here, you see this little face? There were four of them staring at me, four little kids staring at me, hoping and praying I was going to be able to fix Nixon. Well, I did. Um, and that led to um, Cowletta, another piggy that um, I got to work with and use all my tools. Um, I recently have uh, been in super enjoying Charlie Mackesy um, and uh, some of his comments about storms, including fascial storms. They'll pass, um, but they need help and we can help them um, with our presence and our knowledge and our patience and our tools. Um, so love that guy, the end. I can't hear you. I'll stop sharing screen. I'm not hearing you. So, somebody said they're struggling oh, to find that horse anatomy app. I've been muting because the number of blowers, cars, tractors, <laughs> Helicopters, it's been a little crazy. Yeah. Um, I'm really in love with the mute button today. Um, but anyway, they're, yeah. they were having trouble finding that app. So maybe um, you can send me that or you can just post it up. When we put up the video, you can just put it in the comments so people can find okay. it. And, yep. and that. Becky, that was fabulous. And I, you know, so now I wanna go and do that thing with a horse's head and see if it changes the <laughs> You know, I mean, it would be interesting, right? If it was such a simple thing, but the, you, you just keep reinforcing. Oh, I gotta go. I gotta go. My husband has fallen down, and I gotta go help. I'm sorry. Okay. I love you. I Bye. Gotta go. Bye. Stay safe. I hope he's okay. All right, everybody. It's uh, she's had to go because um, there's been something there at home. Um, I'll hopefully everything's okay, and we'll find out. Um, thank you all for joining me. Just remember, you can find this and all the other. Uh, webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Please subscribe and we'll be back in October. So until then, have a wonderful couple of weeks and catch up on the webinars and I'll see you then. Bye everybody.